Coming up on this Thursday edition of Daybreak, it was a fantastic night for Korea's ruling Senate party as they score an overwhelming victory in Wednesday's by-elections, winning 11 of the 15 nationalists up for grabs. Korea's finance minister says the government will inject 25 billion US dollars in the form of fiscal measures and policy financing during the remainder of this year to boost the ailing economy. Plus, the UN accuses Israel of a grave violation of international law after it hits a school sheltering Palestinian families. At least 15 people, mostly women and children, were killed. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us. To our viewers around the world, it's 6am on Thursday, July 31st here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. And we begin with the latest results of the largest by-election in Korea's history, where 15 seats for the National Assembly were up for grabs. With all the votes counted, the ruling party came away very happy indeed, winning 11 seats and regaining its majority in the Assembly. Choi Yusan starts us off. It's a victory for the ruling Senuri party. With a voter turnout of expected 32.9 percent, the ruling party took home 11 out of the 15 parliamentary seats up for grabs in Wednesday's by-elections. That allows the party to regain majority at the National Assembly. Despite the main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy's unity with the minor justice party in three constituencies in the capital region, only one candidate has defeated his ruling party rival. In the hotly contested race of Seoul's Dongjakbi district, the ruling party's former Seoul mayor candidate Na Gyeong Won secured a ticket to parliament after defeating her unified opposition rival Noe Tan, albeit by a margin of a bit over one percentage point. In the Suwansi district of Gyeonggi-do province, opposition candidate and political big name Son ak bowed out to conservative rookie Kim Yong-nam, who garnered nearly 53 percent of votes. In the Suwondi district, the opposition's Park kwang un a former journalist, came out the winner against his ruling party rival and chief of staff to former President Lee myung bak Im Tae-hee, with a difference of over 5,000 votes. The ruling party swept the other three capital area districts, including Kimpo, where the ruling party's Hong chol ho tasted victory against liberal political veteran Kim doo gwan Securing all of the two seats in its traditional stronghold of southeastern Gyeongsang region, the ruling party also took all three seats from the central Chungcheong area. As for the opposition, it won three seats from its political base of southwestern Cheolla region. But the fourth seat in the Suncheon Goksang district was claimed by President Park's close aide Lee Jung Hyun, the first time ever by a ruling party candidate. Choi Yu Sun, Arirang News. Now, the ruling party's landslide victory gives its new chairman a mandate to overhaul the party and move ahead with its support for the president's national reform drive. The main opposition party and its two co-leaders in particular are going to face some very tough decisions in the coming days as they fail to drum up any significant support. Our Jim Young Gil reports. With an unexpected grand victory by the ruling Senuri party in Wednesday's by-election, the newly elected chairman Kim Mu Hong is expected to further boost his authority within the party. The Senuri party will reform itself in a humble manner to become a new Senuri party which will win back credibility in the eyes of the people. The Senuri party will continue to support President Park Geun-hye in carrying out her national reform drives and reviving the economy. The victory is being seen as an indication of public fatigue with the opposition's constant push to highlight the government's shortcomings and it gives the Senuri party a chance to give itself a complete overhaul. The crushing defeat means it's back to the drawing board for the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy. We believe the public reprimanded us for neglecting our duties to take responsibility and undergo reforms. Despite what many people saw as favorable conditions, the opposition bloc failed to garner any significant voter support. 
The opposition party had asked voters to pass judgment on the ruling Sanuri party and the incumbent government for its poor handling of April's ferry disaster and the ensuing investigations. The party's co-leaders Kim ang -gil and An Chol Su will face harsh questions for their poor leadership skills and for hand-picking candidates for by-election districts. The results are expected to help the government rebuild itself in the wake of the ferry disaster and pursue its stated goal of economic revival. The ruling Sanuri Party now has 158 seats in the 300-seat National Assembly. The main opposition party has 130 seats. Jim young -gil, Arirang News. Now, the Korean government, government will inject about 25 billion U.S. dollars into the economy through fiscal measures and policy financing in the latter half of the year. This is part of a $40 billion stimulus package announced last week. Finance Minister Che Gyeong Hwan also told policymakers on Wednesday that the government will soon introduce measures to boost the service sector with the goal of creating more jobs and boosting spending. The Korean economy saw quarterly growth of just 0.6% in the second quarter, its weakest pace in over one year. The U.S. Federal Reserve has decided to continue winding down its bond-buying stimulus plan, cutting its monthly asset purchases to $25 billion from $35 billion. This is their sixth consecutive $10 billion cut, and it means the Fed is on course to end its purchase program in October. Fed officials, led by Chair Janet Yellen, are also stepping up a debate over when to raise the country's interest rates for the first time since 2006, as unemployment falls faster and inflation picks up to its 2% target. For now, though, interest rates were kept near the 0% range, despite the jobless rate in the US falling to a six-year low of 6.1%. Korea's industrial production rose over 2% in June from the previous months. Pretty good. But analysts say it's largely because the output was so low in May following April's ferry disaster. Our Nai Hyung Young reports. A 2.1% monthly rise for all industries and a 2.9% jump in the mining and manufacturing sector in production for the month of June. Statistics Korea says those were the biggest gains in more than three years and nearly five years, respectively. But analysts say it's merely because of a base effect. The June numbers look good because we saw a big drop in May. The increase in domestic shipments of manufacturing goods is very weak. A bigger problem, though, is that overseas shipments are showing negative numbers, meaning exports have not been able to overcome the sluggish economy either. Investment in construction, as well as plants and equipment, are also slowing because of weak domestic demand and unfavorable conditions in the global economy. The near 3 percent rise in the mining and manufacturing sector is attributed to increased output in semiconductors and metal processing driven by demand from both home and abroad. But investment in plants and equipment went down by 1.4 percent from May and spending also only edged up by 0.3 percent. Although it was the first time the overall monthly output has risen since April's ferry disaster, experts say it's too early to say the economy is emerging out of its sluggish trap. They add it doesn't mean the Korean economy is not improving, but the rate it's picking up is still pretty slow. Na Hyun Gyeong, Arirang News. Now, although they're still number one, the top dog, Samsung's strong grip on the smartphone market loosened very considerably in the second quarter of this year. Now, the biggest threat comes from Chinese manufacturers who are gaining ground fast with their cheap but increasingly good quality models. Our Huang Jie has the details. 
Samsung is looking black and blue after getting a blow from its Chinese competitors in the smartphone market. Market research firm IDC says the Korean tech giant's share of the global smartphone market plunged to just over 25 percent in the second quarter of this year. Although it managed to retain the top spot globally, its market share dropped more than seven percentage points from the previous year. The number of Samsung smartphones shipped also fell almost four percent in the April to June period to 74.3 million units. During that same period, however, However, the global smartphone market expanded 23 percent to 295 million units. So which players expanded the handset market? The Chinese. Huawei, China's biggest maker of smartphones, nearly doubled shipments in the second quarter to 20.3 million units, holding down third place in terms of market share with 6.9 percent. Another Chinese tech firm, Lenovo, also gained market share with 5.4 percent, taking fourth place. Its shipments climbed almost 40 percent to 15.8 million units. IDC says the Chinese companies are attracting customers, especially from emerging markets. Markets with lower prices compared to top global rivals like Samsung and Apple. Apple also saw its market share dip by about one percentage point to 11.9 percent. Huang Jie, Arirang News. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now to the latest on the probe into the Sewolho ferry sinking. And prosecutors continue to grill the driver of the ferry operator's owner for a second straight day on Wednesday. 55-year-old Yang Hui Zhang is being questioned over suspicions he helped Yu Byung un evade a massive manhunt before the 73-year-old tycoon was found dead last month. Officials believe Yang could hold the key to finding out what had happened in the days and hours before Mr. Yu's mysterious death. Prosecutors plan to question him again later this morning. Authorities also said DNA testing of 44-year-old Yu de Gyun confirmed that he is the eldest son of uh, the late Yu byung un ruling out suspicions that the body found in that orchard there was mistakenly uh, belonged to someone other than Mr. Yu byung un Now, North Korea fired four short-range projectiles on Wednesday, according to South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff. Only one of the four fired in two rounds is believed to have landed in the East Sea. This is the second test of its kind in just under a week. And in a related event, the United Nations Security Council is reportedly going to meet next Tuesday to discuss North Korea's recent missile launches and various firings, citing government sources. South Korea's Yonhap News Agency reports that the council will be briefed by the UN Sanctions Committee, which was established in 2006 after North Korea's first nuclear test. They are going to update the council every 90 days. Now, uh, Seoul and Washington generally see eye to eye on Pyongyang's growing hostility, missile threats and nuclear tests. But Washington is calling for better ties between Seoul and Tokyo for a united three-way front. Our Connie Kim reports. Both South Korea and the U.S. are raising concerns over North Korea and the escalation of its military provocations under Kim Jong-un's leadership. South Korean Defense Minister Han Mingu has pointed to Pyongyang's third nuclear test last year and recent launches of missile and rockets as evidence of that. He also said that the North has developed more sophisticated launch methods. And his Washington counterpart has echoed such concerns. Their uh, desire for uh, nuclear missiles and nuclear capabilities, as we've said over and over again, uh, are highly threatening to this uh, global security environment. And Locklear pointed to the strained ties between South Korea and Japan as a stumbling block in efforts to put North Korea in check and curb its nuclear weapons development. Uh, they have a, a common concern, huge common concern with North Korea, uh, and that we encourage them to, uh, both Japan and South Korea, to work together to overcome their 
their political difficulties so that we can uh, uh, work to be provide a better security environment in this region. Locklear emphasized that Seoul and Tokyo need to realize the importance of bilateral and trilateral military to military cooperation along with Washington. Historical and territorial disputes between Seoul and Tokyo have dipped bilateral relations to their lowest level in years. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The chief of South Korea's Hyundai Group has asked the South Korean government for permission to visit the North next week to mark the 11th anniversary of her husband's death, who used to operate a cross-border travel business. Industry sources say the chairwoman, Hyun Jong-un, and some 20 executives and employees uh, want to inspect the company's facilities at the Mount Gumgang Resort in North Korea while holding a memorial ceremony uh, over the death of uh, Jong Mong Hon. They add that Hyun plans to make it a one-day visit and she'll go next Monday if she can. Now, if the visit is permitted by Seoul, it will mark Hyun's fourth since the Mount Gumgang tour program was suspended in 2008. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following on this Thursday morning. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim, standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. The death toll in Gaza is rising relentlessly, with more than 30 more Palestinians and three more Israeli soldiers killed on Wednesday. Israeli shelling killed at least 15 Palestinians sheltering in a school in Gaza's biggest refugee camp. It is the sixth UN school to be hit and the second to have deadly consequences. Lamenting that much had been done to keep the more than 200,000 Palestinian refugees in its care safe, the chief of the UN's main relief agency in Gaza called on the world community to take deliberate international political action to end the continuing carnage. At least 16 Palestinians were also killed and more than 200 wounded in an Israeli strike that hit a crowded shopping area in the Shijaya district of Gaza City. Both the attacks came during a four-hour truce called by the Israeli military. Hamas, which controls Gaza, had rejected the truce as meaningless. More than 1,300 Palestinians and 58 Israelis now have died in the conflict. Most of the Palestinian deaths have been of civilians and many of those have been women and children. Over in India, a massive landslide triggered by torrential rains is feared to have trapped up to 200 people in a remote village in Maharashtra state. At least 17 bodies have been recovered from the wreckage after a part of a mountain gave way on Wednesday, spilling down a mix of trees, rocks, mud and debris. With 70 homes still buried underneath, the death toll is expected to rise. Nine disaster response teams made up of nearly 400 personnel have been mobilized, but persisting rains and bad roads into the rural village is making rescue efforts challenging, as is the poor communication infrastructure. The region around the village had been greatly deforested, making the area more vulnerable to landslides. The French government has temporarily closed its embassy and evacuated its ambassador to Libya out of the conflict-ridden country. The foreign ministry said 39 other French nationals and seven Britons were also on the warship that was to transport the group to Toulon. This as rival militias and government forces continue to be riled in fighting both in the capital of Tripoli and Benghazi. The Korean government has also imposed a travel ban to Libya, the first in three years, effective beginning on Monday for six months. U.S. lawmakers at the House of Representatives are expected to pass a resolution that would allow them to sue President Barack Obama for overreaching his authority. Republicans who make up a majority there say the U.S. leader exceeded his authority when he delayed an insurance deadline in his health care law. Opponents to the move call the vote a legally groundless one that will cost American citizens millions of dollars in taxpayer money. The development comes ahead of midterm elections coming up later in November.
And a good Thursday morning to you all as we kick things off with the 2014 Asian Games in Incheon as today officially marks 50 days until the big event. But who are some of the big names to follow? Well, first off, it's Marine boy Park Tae-hwan who dominated during the national team trials earlier this month and hopes to finish more than three gold medals this time as he added the medley events for the first time. Then there's Hun Yun jin Rhythmic Gymnastics who has shown great improvement since the 2012 London Olympics as she hopes to claim the title as the best Asian Rhythmic Gymnastics after September. And after that, we have Yang Ak Sun, who wowed the world with his Yang Wan technique during the 2012 London Games, as he hopes to do it again this time with his new technique, rightfully titled the Yang Two. And now shifting over to the ongoing search for the South Korean national football team's head coach, as Lee Yong Soo and his technical committee began their two-day meeting on Wednesday. And according to the head of the technical committee, on the first day of the meeting amongst his committee, their goal was to choose whether they'll pick a Korean coach or a foreign coach. And once they make their decision, they will choose from the list of candidates they have, whether it be a Korean coach or a foreign coach. Now, he added that the decision will be on a debate-like process as the committee continues to speed up their process in choosing their next head coach. And more football with Son Heung-min back with his club team. He came back to Korea with Bayer Leverkusen facing off against FC Seoul in their Korea Tour 2014 on Wednesday. And while Sun Heung-min didn't get didn't score in this match, he did get a shot on goal and did get to play a full 90 minutes in the match. Meanwhile, Bayer Leverkusen gets a first half goal from Korean Bellamy and a second half goal from Stefan Kiesling as they shut out FC Seoul 2-0 at the Seoul World Cup Stadium. And now finishing things off with some Wednesday night KBO action, the next in heroes continue their winning ways, beat the Hanwha Eagles 6-2 with the NC Dinos sneaking one past the Kia Tigers 5-4 and the Lotte Giants hang on to beat the Tucson Bears 3-1. Meanwhile, an exciting game between the red-hot LG Twins and the first place Samsung Lions, so let's take a look at the highlights. Now right off the bat in the first inning, Lee Jin Young with the bases loaded, singles in two runs for an early 2-0 lead. But we're not done yet, Lee Byung Gyu this time and there it goes to deep right field, gone a three-run shot and it's 5-0. Bottom of the inning, man on second, Pak Hae Min singles home Navarro and it's 5-1. Now, bottom with the second LG up 6 to 1. E.G. Young with a clutch two run double to left, and it's now 6 to 3. Not done yet. This time it's Navarro with a two run single to center, and it's 6 to 5. But Chet Tain quickly ties this game up with his RBI single, and it's 6 to 6. Fast forward to the ninth, Samsung up 7 to 6. It's Sunju in and got a two run shot, and LG has the lead 8 to 7. But bottom with the inning, bases loaded for Kim Hung Goon, hit by pitch, and we're tied 8 to 8. Next play, Chet Tae-in after a 14-pitch battle, singles home the game winner up the middle as the Samsung Lions win this one in the bottom of the ninth, 9-8. to eight. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. While many regions in the peninsula saw the highest temperatures of the season yesterday, and heat wave advisory and heat wave warning are still in place across the region. And for today, it's going to be similar to a bit hotter than yesterday with some outbreaks of rain across the nation. And we are expecting partly sunny skies, but we have Typhoon Nakuri on the way. It's forecast to indirectly affect the southern parts of the Korean Peninsula. So if you're taking an early vacation in Jeju and the southern coast, please pay special attention to the future weather update. Uh, with that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The morning low here in Seoul is starting out at 24, then the high will rise to 33, which is a, a bit higher than yesterday, while Daegu will climb to 32, and Gwangju and Busan will have a daily highs of 31 and 30, respectively. Now, let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju Island and Dokdo will will top out at 29 and at uh, 29 that is and Daejeon should see a highs of 33 and Mount Kungang should reach at 23. Well that's all I have for you at this hour. I hope you have a wonderful start to the day and let's send it back to Mark in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather report there. And those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea today is coming up in half an hour's time. 
We'll be back throughout the day with many more news updates about the by-elections, the re reaction to that. And I'll be back at 10 a.m. Korea time. Until then, goodbye.